So we've learned already that we can use matrices to encode a system of linear equations, and then by row reducing that matrix, we can learn about the solution set consistency, uh, where the pivots are, things like that, right? But we've also introduced the fact that we can we can define matrix multiplication between a matrix and a vector. And in some regard, this matrix multiplication is encoding linear combinations, which admittedly are equivalent to the linear systems we saw before. But in all reality, the reason why we care so much about matrices in linear algebra is that matrices encode linear transformations. Let me explain how that works here. Given a matrix A, which we'll say it's M by N, it has M many rows and N many columns. If we have an M by N matrix, take your favorite vector X inside of Fn. Therefore, the product X times A is well-defined. And using this matrix multiplication, we can define what we call a matrix transformation. Tra by transformation, we just mean there's a function, right? There's a rule that given any input vector, we need an output vector. And so we can associate to the vector X the matrix product A times X. And so this gives us a function, which we call a matrix transformation. Now, as this course is on linear algebra, for the most part, we probably don't care about transformations unless they're linear transformations. And it turns out that multiplying by a matrix is in fact a linear transformation. Because recall, to be a linear transformation, what we need to have is the following property, that for all vectors x and y, well, let me rewrite that one, all vectors x and y inside of our vector space Fn, it must be true that t of x plus y is the same thing as t of x plus t of y. So we need that the transformation preserves vector addition. We also need that we take t of cx. So if you scale x by c, this is the same thing as c times t of x. So because remember, t of x is itself just going to be a vector. It'll live inside of fm. And so a linear transformation preserves vector addition and scalar multiplication. Is matrix multiplication going to do that? So if we take two vectors, what's this time we'll call them u and v, and we take a scalar c, notice that if you take a times u plus v, this is equal to a u plus a v. After all, this is matrix multiplication. We can distribute the matrix factor across the vector sum, and so we get a u and a v. So by the distributive property of matrix multiplication, which we'll talk more about the properties of matrix multiplication in greater detail in chapter three, but because of the distributive property, we can distribute matrix multiplication across a vector sum, and therefore it preserves vector sums. And likewise, when it comes to matrix multiplication, you have A times CU. Well, this is just a product of things. We can factor the scalar out and we get C times AU. So matrix multiplication preserves the scalar multiple there. And so this tells us that matrix multiplication, in fact, induces a linear transformation. Every matrix transform is actually a linear transform. And what's going to be impressive for us is that later on in this series, we will see that every linear transformation is actually just matrix multiplication with the right perspective. But that's, that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. Let's just play around with this matrix transformation for just a quick example here. Uh, and so let's let's do the following. Let's consider the matrix, the, the three by two matrix that you see right here, zero, negative two, one, negative three, two, negative three. Uh, this will induce a transformation from R2 to R3. So notice that the matrix, this is a little bit backwards, but the matrix we write as three by two. So three rows, two columns, this induces a map from R2 to R3. So notice how it kind of gets swapped around here. And that's because the matrix A, you have to times it by a vector in R2 because it has two columns. And then when you're done, you'll get a matrix, you'll get a, excuse me, you'll get a vector with three entries, which is in R3. And so this is the matrix transformation induced by T of, T of X is going to be A times X. So we get the following formula right here. So we could multiply by A, and that gives us matrix transformation. So if we want to do something like, what's T of U, where U is given as this vector right here? Well, that would mean, so T of 
t of 3, negative 1. This means we're going to multiply by the matrix A, which we see above is 0, negative 2, 1, negative 3, 2, and negative 3, like so. You times it by 3 and negative 1. So what we've learned about matrix multiplication is that when you times a matrix by a vector, this is a linear combination. It's a linear combination of the column vectors scaled by the scalars in the vector. So this is going to give you 3 times 0, 1, 2, plus, I should say, minus 1 times negative 2, negative 3, and negative 3. Which, when we simplify this thing, we end up with, well, times the first one by 3, we get 0, 3, 6. Times the second one by negative 1, we're going to get 2, 3, 3. And so then combining terms there, that is combining components, you get 0 plus 2, which is 2, 3 plus 3, which is 6, and 6 plus 3, which is equal to 9. And so 2, 6, 9 is then the evaluation. The vector u got mapped to the vector 2, 6, 9. Now, one thing I want to mention here is that if you were to kind of do this generally speaking, right, with this matrix transformation, uh, notice you would get something like the following. You're going to end up with x1 times the vector 0, 1, 2. And then you're going to get the vector, well, x2 times the vector negative 2, negative 3, negative 3. And so when you combine those together, this will look something like, well, you're going to get a 0x1 minus 2x2. You're going to get x1 minus 3x2. And then lastly, you're going to get a 2x1 minus a 3x2. So you can see right here, we get a formula very similar to how we described linear transformations back in chapter one. Didn't I tell you that a linear transformation would be formed by writing a vector whose components are linear combinations of the original variables? Well, that looks like what we got going on right here. This idea of matrix vector multiplication that gives you a linear combination of the column vectors will produce exactly something like that. And so in the future, we'll show you how to kind of reverse this process. Given a linear transformation, how do we write this as a matrix? But when it comes to this matrix multiplication, I do want to mention to you sort of like this general principle. If you have a matrix, let's say A11, A12, up to A1N, then you have A21, A22, all the way up to A2N, and then this continues on until you end with AM1, AM2. Let me slide it up a little bit. And then you end up with AMN. So this is like a general matrix. And you take the vector x1, x2, all the way up to xn. I do want you to be aware, though, as you, as you write out this linear combination, you end up with x1 times the first vector, a11, a21, all the way up down to am1. You're going to get the second vector, x2, times this time a12, a22, all the way down to a2m. And then finally, this would add up to be, add up with the last term being xn times a1n, a2n, all the way down to amn, like so. So when you, do the, when you do the multiplication, you get this linear combination. But then what happens when you do these scalar products, right? You're going to times the first one by x1, the next one by x2, last one with xn. So when you put that together, you end up with this x1, a11. And I'm going to write it like we usually do for a linear system, a11x1 plus a12x2, and this will continue down to a1nxn. That's the first entry. Then you get like a21x1, a22x2, all the way down to a2nxn. This will then continue down, and you're left with, in the last entry, am1x1 plus a m2 x2 all the way down to a m n x n and so when you look at the final product here you get the single vector where the like if you look at the first entry for a moment what you do here is you take all of the elements in the first row of the matrix a and you times it by all of the entries in the vector x and then for the second entry you're going to take all of the entries in the second row of the matrix, you're going to multiply them by the entries in the vector x and you add them together. And then you proceed to do this for each entry. So if we were to proceed from this original problem one more time, you would see something like the following. Whoops. If we take the matrix, 
well, actually it's right here. If you take the first row and you times it by the, the vector here, you're gonna end up with a vectors whose entry would look like zero times three minus two times negative one. And then you do the second row times the vector like this, you're then gonna get the row times the vector or the times the column, you're gonna get one times negative three plus three times, I'm sorry, you're gonna get negative three times negative one. And then the last one, you're gonna get the third row times the column. If you multiply a row by a column, you get two times three minus three times negative one right here. And as you simplify these things, you're gonna get the same values like we did before, right? You're gonna get a two, you're going to get negative three plus, uh, you're gonna get negative three plus three here. Oh, I'm sorry, you're gonna get, uh, I forgot an entry here. Oh, that's that's my issue here. My spider sense was tingling there, three times one. And so you're gonna get three plus three plus three, which is a six. And then the last one you'll get six plus three, which is nine. And so this gives you sort of an alternative way of computing matrix uh, vector multiplication. It kind of jumps over the middle step of the linear, the linear combinations. And you're basically just taking rows times columns. Uh, some people like this approach, and by all means, feel free to use it as you do these matrix vector multiplications. We'll probably do more and more of it when we start doing general matrix multiplication. And likewise, um, it's just convenient, just convenient right now, right here and now. And so we saw how we can evaluate a matrix transformation, but we often have to go the other way around. What if we have something in the co-domain? Can we determine whether this vector is in the range of the function is there some vector x that maps onto the vector b equals negative eight negative seven negative two so we're trying to we're trying to solve the equation t of t of x is equal to b but be aware that's the same thing as solving the equation ax equals b which is the same thing as trying to determine is b inside the column space of the matrix that's that's what we basically have to do right here so with this matrix transformation, we have if our vector b is in fact in the image of the function, that means there has to be some vector x, which when multiplied by the matrix a gives us the vector b. This is a this matrix equation is a linear system, and b will be in the column space exactly if this system right here is consistent. That is what we have to determine. And so we convert over to the associated augmented matrix where the coefficient matrix will be just the matrix of the transformation. And then the vector in question, is this in the image? That's the augmented column right here. So to start solving the system of equations, we need, well, our pivot position is gonna be in the one, one spot. That's a zero, we need something non-zero. So I'm just gonna grab the second row since there's a one right there. And so now our pivot position has a one in it. To get rid of the two in the bottom row, we'll take row three minus two times row one. So we're gonna get minus two plus six and plus 14. And then modifying the bottom row here, we're gonna get zero, we're gonna get three, and then 14 take away two is a 12. That finishes the first column. So then our pivot position is gonna to move to the two, two spot. Um, I noticed that everything in the, in the second row is divisible by negative two. So I'm actually gonna divide out the negative two. So negative one half row two, but also since I'm at it, the third row, everything's a multiple of three, so we're gonna divide everything by three there. Uh, and so then looking at the next matrix down here, my second row looks like zero, one, four, but that's also my third row. So that's gonna be easy. R3 take away R2, R2. Um, and so that gives us the following matrix that we see right here. Um, you do have a row of zeros, but that's no problem for consistency. Uh, so far, so good. I can actually mention that this matrix that we see here is in echelon form. And so because it's in echelon form and there's no contradictions, that does tell us that the system in question is consistent. That means the vector in play here is inside the column space of the matrix A. It turns out that this vector is in the image of the linear transformation that we're considering. But what vector will map onto it? We have to continue to solve the system to see that. And so notice, you know, we only need one more step to get in row reduced echelon form. We're gonna finish it by doing that. We're gonna take row one and add to it three times row two. So we add a three and we're gonna add a 12. And so now here we see our 
well, we see the RREF of our matrix right here. So we should set X1 equal to five, and we should set X2 equal to four. And so then what we claim here is that T of the vector five comma four will do exactly what we needed to do. And so we can verify this, right? What was our matrix again? It was zero, negative two, one, negative three, two, and negative three. We times this by the vector five and four. And so take the first row times the column. This is going to give us zero minus eight. Take the second row times the column. This is going to give us five minus 12. Take the third row times the column. This is going to give us 10 minus 12, like so. And then simplifying, we get a negative eight, we get a negative seven, and we get a negative two, which, in case we had forgotten, was in fact the vector B that we were trying to show was inside the column space of this matrix. That is, it's inside the image of the function. So it turns out that we can consider all the same type of things with a matrix transformation that we did with linear transformations before. The fact that we have a matrix does make life a little bit easier for us. And so we'll get some practice with this, uh, these matrix transformations from this section here. Uh, thank you for watching. That actually brings us to the end of section 2.2. Uh, we're going to continue in the next section, talk about linear independence. Um, I hope you'll take a look at that video. See you, everyone.